What have been some of uh, the difficulties you face talking about Black Lives Matter to your friends or family that aren't Black? Um, and uh, What changes do you think are needed for uh, America to prove that Black Lives Matter to them? Um, well, let's first start with saying that people over the course of history have not been very receptive, but I do believe that people are becoming way more receptive now and kind of are finally starting to open up their eyes to what we've been trying to say for a long time now. Um, the first thing I would say is that finding an approach that works for the person that you're speaking to is super important. I, like Portia has mentioned, I tend to get emotional or sometimes angry when there's a certain topic being discussed, obviously because it's something I'm passionate about, but I've had to learn that I cannot get people to understand when I'm speaking through anger or uh, more so like coming down on them or seeming like I'm reprimanding them. So really understanding an approach for each person is super important. Um, aside from that, you also have to acknowledge for the sake of preserving your own energy that some people really are not going to get it as much as you try. So you can try to educate someone, but there's a certain point where you, you're you basically going to be talking to a wall if these people are just not open to receiving the information you're giving them. Um, of course, there are some that are willing to be educated, and that's why it's super, super important that we, and especially as white people, take the time to educate them. I think that, unfortunately, we're taken more seriously. And when a white person says something that a black person has already said 20 times, for whatever reason, it's more easily understood or taken more seriously. So, obviously, talking to people that are not black is kind of trickling down the information. So it is important that you really get your point across accurately, eloquently, concisely, um, so that it kind of resonates with the person that you're speaking to. Uh, aside from that, generally having patience, that's something that I struggle with and I've had to practice um, having patience to talk to people who may not get it as easily as you would expect them to. Another thing is that I really wanted to touch on this. There's such a stigma on talking politics in the office. And I think now more than ever, that stigma needs to go out the window as it pertains to Black Lives Matter, especially when, you know, your boss is white and has no clue what you're even talking about. I personally have committed to always speak about it. If there's a comment made in my presence, I will always speak on it. I will always give my opinion. I do not condone white silence. I don't condone sitting back while conversations are taking place that you could educate people in and then you sit there and let it happen and you don't correct or you don't try to educate. Um, so, and I, I just think that we need to stop pretending like it's an uncomfortable thing so that it's easier to just ignore it. It is uncomfortable, but it will become more comfortable when we we get used to having the conversations and we stop being afraid of, of the topic. Thank you so much for saying it. And I, I think we are seeing white voices, you know, advocates speak up, you know, to their peers, to their family, checking each other, like, at a rate I've never seen in my life. It's, it's really yeah. almost overwhelming. You know, it's good to just as black people, you know, it gets tiring having to educate and, you know, debate people all the time. I think I speak well and people respect my voice. So I have a duty to communicate these things whenever I see dissension or people aren't getting it. And just to really close that gap, that's something you do really well. I think I've seen a lot of other uh, white folks do that or uh, pale people. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> you like, wait a minute, <laughs> half. But um, yeah, it, it we really need that. It makes it takes the load off of us because it's exhausting, and but it needs to be. It seen. is like you said. Whenever it comes from your voice, sometimes it, you know, depending on the audience, it weighs different because they're not gonna believe me. They're ready to 
have a rebuttal already, no matter what I say. Uh, and I think I try to speak strategically where people can't get out of it or, or something like that. So uh, I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. That's what non-black people could really do and continue to do is to, you know, check their friends, check their family, speak up, don't be silent. If somebody think, oh, they can say certain things just because a black person isn't in the room. No, it's not okay for anybody. And to check that kind right. of thinking, uh, that's absolutely the right path on that. Um, so um, as somebody that's dated interracially, how can uh, women who date black men support Black Lives Matter? Um, well, I think more than anything, and in my experience, listening is the best thing you can do. Um, do not apply your own experiences to certain situations involving your spouse or partner if they're black. I have personally been treated differently than literally a man who's right next to me who I'm dating who is black at the same establishment. Um, I have spoken with white women, for example, who really weren't aware, being with a black man, were not aware of these vast differences in the way that we're treated. So I think more than anything is educating yourself on the difference between the two experiences, knowing that your walk of life is not going to be nearly the same as the person that you're with, um, listening, like I said, to their experiences, and something that I think is really really needed obviously for any black man and and as a white woman maybe we're not as aware and we need to be more aware but i think that black men are generally not allowed to be vulnerable and their mental health is not really discussed enough so i think it's really important to try to be in tune with their mental health their well-being their spiritual well-being uh protect them encourage them check in with them know that a hard day for you does not equate a hard day for them. It could be two totally different experiences. Um, so just really being aware that you guys come from different cultural backgrounds and you, you have to be in tune with what they may be going through and knowing to ask those questions even when it's not being discussed directly with you. Absolutely. Um... I, th I think you're absolutely right on that. And I'm, honestly, you, you got that pretty much completely uh, right on that for me. Uh, one other uh, thing I want to touch on before we moved on uh, that I've, you know, seen different opinions on and, and, and people, you know, assume this about me, you know, having had been in a, a in a, in a, racial relationship not with a white woman but still not black um is the the self-hate part so like okay uh, a black man could have a preference or if they are attracted to other races you can do that without like putting down black women uh, at the same time and i think from the non-black experience being able to check that as well whenever that happens is uh important because you know they're a whole black women are the a whole other side of the movement you know that could be uh overshadowed sometimes since we see uh, a lot of the brutality happening to to men you know uh, it happens to all of us but still um uh, not to get lost in in that as well um uh, I think is important and I think you you do a really good job um at that as well. Thank you. Uh Portia, I want to um uh ask you another uh question. Uh so over time um how have you felt and seen society change? Um I know you you're in your 60s, you've got to experience a lot of different, you know, changes so from being a black woman to being gay um, and seeing all those different things. We've seen some legislation happen uh, this week that from the Supreme Court. Um, and I just want to talk about, well, wanted you to talk about, have you seen those changes and what do you think is next? What's the big item, well, the big agenda items legislation wise that you think will uh, help black LGBT uh, members? now that that legislation has been passed to not being able to 
fire somebody or discriminate uh, based off of their orientation? Well, actually, in spite of the things that have been in the news lately, I don't think that things have really changed all that much. Most people that are gay could still be fired because most of our jobs are at will jobs. Um, unless you're something, somebody like in a profession like law or you're a physician or something like that where you are, you're a professional and you work for yourself, you can still be fired. And just simply, they just can't put it to the fact that you're gay or you're black. But anyway, that's, that's something that still has to be worked on. Um, I don't think that there's been very many changes the way society looked at black gay people because the LGBTQ community is the same as society as a whole. The prejudice that is in society is still within the LGBTQ community. I would love to be able to say that there is a difference, that we Black people are supported more because of the fact that they started, Black trans women started the Stonewall riot and all of that, but that's just not so. It's, to be honest, um, even I think that within the gay community, and I mean the all-inclusive gay, just to keep from putting out the alphabets, within the gay community, there's even more prejudice because shit rolls downhill. So you have a marginalized community and everybody has to feel as though they're better than somebody else. So within the gay community, you have people who are already feeling that everybody's looking at them as though they're not as good as. So they have to have somebody that they feel that they're better than. So that's the white community, then they feel they're better than black gay people. And then black gay people in turn are feeling like they're better than the black trans people. So we still have a long way to go. And, 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 and then at the very bottom, at the very bottom of the shit he, she, shit he, he is older people, older gay people. So constantly fighting the battle. And I don't have much time left to fight this battle. So that's why I do what I do. What's, what's your advice? Where do we go? How, how, do we, how do we combat that? How do we get those, you know, this marginalized society to work as a better whole uh, and make a more inclusive environment for all of you? I don't know. I mean, I wish I wish I knew the answer. You know, legislation is out there now for the greater society, but within my community, there is no legislation. There is no okay, look, you gay white people, you all need to treat us better. There is nothing like that. And and so it's just incumbent on those that feel our pain to take up our cause. Now that's happening somewhat, but it's not happening fast enough. You know, I've, I've actually had to have um, white people, especially young white people, speak for me, um, administer, be administrators in groups that I create even within my Silver Pride Project organization, I, I had to have a face that was not mine because otherwise I would have never gotten support within the community. Mm. It's hard. You had to have a kind of a Trojan horse situation. Hey, you're 
kind of like yeah. your, your information or your message through a different package so it could be accepted. Wow. Yes. Uh, ooh, that's, that's got to be really, really tough, especially for, you know, something that you created yourself. Um, so I think kind of going, piggybacking off of what Anna said, just about her experience with interracial dating, I think a solution within the uh, the gay community is that to listen. You know, you are you mentioned that um, you, 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 you're cut off often uh, whenever you do start speaking. They're already ready to rebut or ready to talk. They're not really taking what you're saying at face value. Um, I think they got to be able to listen to your experiences too. Um, uh, black women's experience, uh, black trans experience to really know, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, as a total group, you guys been oppressed, but they've been, they're, the, they're oppressors as well. And I think if they could understand that or at least hear those stories of those transgressions that, you could really start having the conversation to move forward at that point. So what, um, what advice would you give to a young person that might be struggling with their sexuality, um, especially if, if they happen to be a person of color, black uh, and gay, and they might not feel uh, comfortable coming out or support it, We've seen different uh, commentary. I know I have on Dwayne Wade and his son. I love that he loves his son unconditionally and really supports him and really got behind the movement. And, you know, black folks sometimes could be, you know, they could be limited in their, their thinking when it comes to uh, accepting that because, you know, I feel like, you know, they might be raised in a, in a certain way, in a traditional, well, uh, it's based off of the church and, you know, that, that hate or information might be uh, spread in a, in a poisonous and toxic way. So I feel like black people have a hard time coming out because, you know, it's harder for them to be accepted just from, um, from what I've seen uh, from their families. Uh, I have uh, a couple of, you know, lesbian uh, family members that it took them a long time to come out. I have one that got married to a man, and I knew I knew forever that this person was gay. But I'm like, okay, they 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 really are trying to convince themselves or forcing themselves possibly into a uh, a uh, a persona just so they could possibly feel accepted and it took them a while to even be okay with themselves and how much of themselves did they miss out on trying to please everybody else? What do you say to those people? Find, find your tribe. You know, you can't, you can't live your life without any kind of connection. And nobody is ever going to have 100% acceptance from anybody, from everybody in their lives. So find the people who make you feel comfortable, even if it means that you may never speak to your father or your sisters or whoever. You know, to me, and, and I've been... I've been out since I was 15, you know, I've been homeless. I've been, I've been through it. There isn't anything that anybody can come up with that I haven't experienced, but find the people who make you feel good about yourself. You can, you can stay in the closet and be around your family and have them love and accept you, but then you won't accept yourself. You look in the mirror and you'll realize that you're not happy with the person that's looking back at you. So to me, it's better if you find that family and that family is that rainbow family and 
Let them embrace you. That's that's powerful. Thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And uh, you were quoted in the Dallas Morning, the Dallas Morning News. Uh, sometimes you got to create what you want to be a part of. And what what else do you think is needed to be? Uh, what else do you think is needed to make institutional changes that will impact the country and this planet? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, when, when the this whole situation with watching um, that poor baby with those police officers knee, that police officer's knee on his neck, and watching him die, I mean. And you think that there, there, there's going to be, there can be nothing good coming from this. But, um, and, and I was, I put, made a post about this feels different this time around. And it does, because I've seen, I've, I, I lived through the white flight from Gary, and I lived through the LA riots, and I lived through so many things. And this time it does feel different. Um, and I'm not talking about um, the gay community. I'm talking about the world as a whole. So I think somehow that young people created a movement that's going to change the world. I mean, I don't know if it's because we as parents raised so many of you white and black to see things differently than my generation did. But I do know that this is different because you all are making it different and, and, and you're making those connections that allow people to support you. And that's so important. You know, um, I, that's, that's the only thing I can think of. I can't explain it. I don't know what else can be done, but I do know for a fact that whatever it is that's going to be happening, that's going to change, is going to change because of you, you all, your generation, and those that come behind you. Thank you, and uh, we're definitely, I'm motivated by you. I uh, served on the uh, Dallas Police Department's Police Advisory Board, um, and you know, you referenced me uh, to that. Well, was there anything from those meetings that you got that that could have a powerful change uh, moving forward or something that might have been discussed that isn't implemented yet that could help curb some of this violence? I'm very big on community policing. I think that um, Chief Hall has it right. Right. And that's not a very popular opinion right now, but she, she believes in the members of the police department mixing with the community. My personal feeling, though, is that police officers should live in the city that they police. Um, we have an MP, our, in our neighborhood police officer, one of them lives in our neighborhood. And so many times there have been issues, and I'm not gonna lie, I have him on speed dial. I'll text him in the middle of the night, and he will handle it. And it doesn't escalate to the point where I have to call 911. And a lot of people in our neighborhood are like that. They know that because he lives here, he's going to take care of things in a way that somebody who doesn't live in the community will, I, I like, well, anyway, the, to make no, a long No, you're right. You're on the right track. I know exactly where you're going. Go ahead. Because this is where he lives. He's going to take care of this community. He knows when he gets takes off that uniform, he's going to have to live 
in this area. So he is going to make sure that this, that, that um, we, we are taken care of because we're his community. We are, he takes care of us and we take care of him. You know, he lives here and he doesn't want things to just explode. I think you, I think you got the answers. I think that's it. I think, so how many times have we heard, okay, a cop pull up to some uh, black person and say, oh, well, you, you look suspicious or they might stop because they look suspicious. They're not from that neighborhood. They don't know if they live there or not. So if they don't know them, you know, yeah, they might be suspicious to them. Um, if you are patrolling the area that you live in, you know your neighbors, you know the store owners and, you know, the community and things like that. If you're patrolling that area, you know, that person that might be walking around, that might be a black kid you know you know him you know oh that's you, know, you might have known him for 10 years you know you're gonna react to that person in crime differently to your community and because yes. you know who the people are i think that yeah. that has a lot of opportunity to uh, curve some of the violence yes anna I want to um I want to talk a little bit about some of the um, volunteer work that you've done especially uh when it comes to feeding the homeless. I know you're really huge on that. You take money out of your own pockets to uh to do things. I just want to have you like touch on that a little bit and uh I think that's something a lot of people could do on their own. You really motivated me. Um, the first time I uh, went out there with you, I want you to talk about that a little bit because I think that's something a lot of people could incorporate on their own and uh, go out there and pay it for it as well. Sure. Um, I think there's a lot of ways to be an activist for the homeless community. And I think that a lot of people rely on organizations to be that middleman and to give them access to volunteer work. And I think that's a huge misconception that people have is that it's not such an approachable thing to do. Um, to give you examples of things that I've done, obviously you know that I I go to Aldi and I spend you know 70 bucks on sandwich stuff. I can literally make 100, 150 sandwiches. I can pack up lunches that include fresh fruit, water, chips, whatever you choose to do. Um, and we go and just hand it out. You find some spots where there's a lot of homeless people and it is kind of intimidating, but they're super appreciative. And uh, a lot of these people feel so forgotten that to have conversations with them, to know their names, to not be afraid to touch them. Well, obviously right now with coronavirus, you gotta be a little careful, but in general, these are people that have preferences. They have names, they have families, they have histories, they have experiences. Um, so you can do that. That's one way that you could help the community. Something as simple as just buying a homeless person a meal. I've done it where I see a homeless person, I'm like, hey, you want something? You go through the Wendy's uh, drive through pick them up a burger meal, you hand it off to them. Um, buy them some water. Um, there's been a couple, a couple of homeless people in my area who I've given clothes and things like that when it's winter time and I see that they don't have a good winter jacket. I'll pack up winter coats or blankets that I have left over and I'll drive around the city and hand those out. So it doesn't really have to be just one thing. It doesn't have to be, I'm going to set up a Saturday morning volunteer session. It's literally you're living your life in a humanitarian way where you're showing compassion in a lot of aspects and any opportunity you're given, you take it, whether it's small or big or whatever the case may be. It could be a couple bucks. It could be a, a bottle of water. I've given away, like I bought a coffee and a pastry at Starbucks. I pull up to the light. I gave my pastry away. Like who cares? It's a pastry, you know, and we go out and we spend 10, 20 bucks on mindless things. And that's money that could be applied to making a huge difference in your community. And not just that, but all of us 
could be one or two paychecks away from being homeless. Any of us could find ourselves in a situation where we might need compassion from somebody else. So in general, to apply that to your life, like I said, it doesn't have to be such a structured thing. Just simply do it as you can and as you see the opportunity to do so. Thank you for uh, sharing it. Um, for our listeners out there, again, you don't have to do the crazy extensive Google searches and register and go to a training and stuff like that. Even if it might not necessarily be legal, do what you got to do. Shoot, uh, give uh, sandwiches out. Like uh, Anna said, how many times have we spent, you know, we're at Jack in the Box after going to Deep Elm or something like that. We were about 10 tacos and everything else that's on that dollar menu you know like we probably ain't gonna eat all of it anyway you know there's you, there's those people you see uh they exist um i challenge you to look them in the eye even if you don't got it just acknowledging them if they're out there in the corner hey sorry i don't got it if you do got a couple quarters in there don't be afraid to interact with them they're people um of all walks of life i think when it comes to creating a side, the society that we want of the quality, we got to look at every piece of it, not just because you're black, if you're homeless, if you're poor, if you're gay, any of those things, all these people are people. We all have our own experiences, our own uh, stories. We need to have uncomfortable conversations. Uh, we need to ask questions. We need to listen uh, to each other uh, to, help broaden our perspective because there's a lot of stuff that you just don't even know out there i challenge you to talk to people that don't look like you that don't live like you and uh work together to to speak up whenever you hear that hate out there uh, do your part have those conversations challenge your family challenge your friends black lives matter uh, don't be afraid. This is the time you want to be on the right side of history. Um, I thank both of you ladies for being on the show. Uh, today we're about to wrap up. Um, COVID is still very real out there. Make sure y'all continue to be safe. If you're going to go out there and protest, have a mask on. Just be safe. You know, I have a new mantra is revolt, recharge, relax, repeat. So make sure you're having balance in your life. Don't wear yourself out so you can continue to fight the good fight to see the changes that we're going to do. You can't just go at it every single day. You're going to wear yourself out. We need you. Uh, so take a couple of days off, watch a movie if you need to, then get back to it. <laughs> Don't get complacent um, with, um, with the world that you live in, especially if you are in a world of privilege and uh, I thank both of you guys or both of you ladies for um, for being on and sharing your stories and being so vulnerable um, in telling those stories. Um, so thank you. Um, we want to plug the, the silverproject.com. Check that out to, um, to get a little bit more information about Portia's organization. You can also follow them on Facebook at Silver Pride Dallas. Silver Pride Project Dallas on Facebook and Silver Pride Project on Instagram. Make sure you give them some love. Here's some additional resources if you want to get involved in the cause for Black Lives Matter. Uh, BlackLivesMatter.com, NAACP.org, and the ACLU.org. Um, also, we are recommending you watch Trigger Warning with Killer Mike on Netflix. Um, Thanks for joining us for an uncomfortable conversation. Follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram for more videos, blogs, and other content. We're going to be releasing clips soon of these conversations. Uh, so um, you don't have to watch the, the full thing if, uh, at a time. If you, we understand everybody got everything, uh, got things to do on that. So, but we're going to break them up into questions. Um, we are going to start hosting these on our website coming up soon in development. Shout out to Nick Birdwell and Murphy Birdwell, my uh, co-executive producers on this. Thanks for um, 
listening. Um, if you have any interesting um, ideas or you want to be a part of the show, uh, go ahead, reach out to us on the Uncomfortable Conversation fan page, and uh, we'll uh, take a look at that. Um, again, uh, here, here are the credits. Um, do y'all have any final words before we close this out, uh, Anna and Portia? Um, Black Lives Matter, so let's just keep on fighting. Yeah, keep doing it. Don't stop. Don't stop. Thank you again for your support and for being on. Um, again, our guest was Anna Hillman and Portia Cantrell. Thank you. Uh, keep up the great fight. Um, and uh, we'll see you guys again soon for episode three of Uncomfortable Conversations. I'm your host, So Sick. And um, thanks for rocking with us. Subscribe, and uh, we'll see you soon.